Okay. <clears throat> Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> Don't panic. I'm not going to go all the way back there. Just kind of just pick it up. In 16 and 17, Paul declares that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile. So he says that in 1, 16, 17. And then in 1, 18, down through chapter 3, verse 20, he establishes the guilt of all humanity before God. The dire situation from which the gospel rescues mankind. And we went through, through all that. So when 1, 18 to 3, 20, he establishes that. And then having set the stage in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, he declares his main point, which is the availability of God's righteousness to all who respond in faith in Christ. So Paul, last or two weeks ago, we talked about that 321 to 26, this uh, theologically dense section of Scripture that Martin Luther had said was the center of the, epistle, of the epistle to the Romans and of the whole Bible. And it is really rich. 321 to 26. Paul says there that this righteousness is available to and it's needed by all because there's no distinction between people that has any relevance to salvation. He's thinking especially of the dichotomy Jews and Gentiles. But he says this righteousness, it's, that it's available to and it's needed by all people. Because there is no distinction between people that has any relevance to salvation. The fact of the matter is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, meaning they fail to exhibit the God likeness for which we were created. So all have sinned. There's no difference, and all are in need of this righteousness. So any who are pronounced righteous, Paul says in this section 321 to 26, that we talked about two weeks ago. So any who are pronounced righteous, who are declared acquitted of all charges, they're pronounced so as a gift given to them by God through the redemption, the liberation through the payment of a price, through the redemption that's accomplished in Christ Jesus. Our innocence before God, as I said two weeks ago, is absolutely, completely, totally unmerited. It is simply something we are incapable of buying, incapable of purchasing, of earning. It is a gift that is given to us in the grace of God. And in the crucifixion of Christ, Paul makes the point in that section 321 to 26 that God demonstrated his righteousness, showed himself to be of righteous character, and that he provided a way in which he could forgive justly. That he could forgive in a way that's consistent with his nature, which is both loving and just. So Paul makes that point. And let's pick back up with 327 to 31. I read it, and I think the bell rudely interrupted me. So we'll read it again, and then we'll carry on from there. 327, he says, Where then is boasting? It was excluded. Through what law? That of works? No, but through the law of faith. For we hold that a man is pronounced righteous by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of Gentiles? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will pronounce righteous the circumcision from faith and the uncircumcision through the faith. Do we then nullify the law through the faith? Absolutely not. Rather, we uphold the law. So Paul here in this section, he says, look, given that salvation is a gift, that it is a work of God that's appropriated by faith. There's no basis for boasting. It's a gift. There's no basis for boasting as though salvation was achieved. You see, as though it was something that we earned. It was something that we accomplished. No, it's a gift. So Paul is thinking here particularly of the Jews. You see, and, the, and their tendency... Uh, at least of some of them, to think that they're works of the law. You see, that they were circumcised, they observed the Sabbath days and all the, all the holy days. 
that they observed the food laws. And they had a sense, some of them, that this somehow gave them a claim on God. Paul says, look, such boasting is excluded, not by the law of works, but by the, quote, law of faith. That is, by the rule, the principle. See, he uses law in a different way now. He's playing off the concept of the law of Moses. Rather, it's excluded by the rule or the principle that justification is by faith apart from works of the law. So he says, where's boasting? It's excluded. Why? Because the way that you're justified is as a gift through faith. So what do you have to boast about? What do you have to boast about? Somebody has given you a gift. And we have to always understand that. That is central, crucial, fundamental, that we recognize that. If justification, if it were by works of the Mosaic law, then only Jews could be justified. This is an interesting argument that Paul makes. You see, he focuses on the fact there's one God. And you're going, well, what is, what is that? how is this one God tied to what Paul is saying? And I think the argument he's making is that, look, if justification were by works of the Mosaic law, then only Jews could be justified. You'd have to be a Jew, become a Jew, live like a Jew, do all of the peculiarly Jewish things, not simply the moral things. But all of those other things that are part of the Mosaic law that define Jews, circumcision, food laws, all of those things, you would have to become a Jew. I'm saying that would imply what? That would imply that God is the God only of Jews. But that's not true, you see. The fact is, is that since there's only one God, He's the God of both Jews and Gentiles. Otherwise, the Gentiles would have no God. You see, so it's not a case, well, the Jews have their God and Gentiles have a God over here. He says there's only one God. And so he is the God of Jews and Gentiles. And as the God of both Jews and Gentiles, he, in Christ, he justifies people in a way that accepts and, in fact, transcends their national and cultural identities. He justifies in a way that accepts their national identities and cultural identities. He justifies by faith. He justifies by faith. In other words, the God, in the gospel, the universality of God's rule, that he is one God who rules both Jews and Gentiles, the universality of God's rule is clearly manifested because in the gospel, salvation is available to Gentiles as Gentiles. You see, they don't have to be Jews. They don't have to become Jews. Salvation is available to... So there's one God who's God of Jews and Gentiles. And in the gospel, the fact that God saves through a means that preserves or recognizes or accepts the national and cultural identities of Jews and Gentiles is flows out of the fact that there is one God. And so this is the idea. The dividing wall of the law has been removed. You know, remember in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 down through chapter 3, verse 6, where Paul talks about breaking down the dividing wall of the law, which separated Jews and Gentiles. And so what he's talking about, you see, there were these things that there were in the law you have this separation of Jews and Gentiles that made Jews where they, they did these things like the Sabbath observance, circumcision, the food laws, that distinguished them and made them a separate people different from the Gentiles. That is why you had this, this distance. It wasn't in the moral things. It was in some of these peculiarly covenantal things that God gave to Israel. I'll talk about that in a minute. But he gives to them. So he says that wall that it was dividing wall has been broken down so that we now have what? Jew and Gentile as one in one body in Jesus Christ. So Paul is just talking about, here he ties, he says, salvation by faith apart from the Mosaic law, as I understand Paul, that flows naturally out of the truth of monotheism, out of the truth that there is one God. The universality of the gospel, which saves this, through faith in this message, without becoming a Jew or Gentile, flows out of the fact that there is one God and therefore he is the God of both Jew and Gentile. So I think that's what Paul is saying. And in response to Paul's insistence that justification is by faith to the exclusion of works of the law, some apparently then accused Paul, or at least Paul was concerned that he would be accused, of nullifying the law. 
that, he, that his doctrine, that, he, that it would wind up that the effect of his doctrine was to nullify the law, meaning deny that the law had any utility, any usefulness. And Paul flatly denies that. Rather than nullify the law, he says here that Christians uphold the law. That, that's not true at all. That's not, we, we don't nullify the law. Rather, we uphold the law, meaning they uphold the transcendent moral requirements that are part of that law. I want to talk about this. I've said this before, but there are a few, a few things that I like to hit on because uh, I think they're important and sometimes uh, well, I don't think they, that they're as familiar as they should be. So I repeat them. But here's something I want to say about this, about the, the Mosaic Law. Because in my judgment, there's some confusion about that that pops up. The Abrahamic covenant, you know, the covenant that God makes with Abraham. This is the fundamental covenant governing the relationship of God with his people. That's the foundational, this fundamental covenant he makes with Abraham. The blessings promised by God to Abraham and his seed, those blessings were predicated on people trusting God and accepting Him for who He is, that He is God. So He has this covenant that He makes with Abraham and His seed. And then the Mosaic Covenant, this is entered into centuries later. So we have the Abrahamic Covenant, and then the Mosaic Covenant is entered into hundreds of years later by God and the people of Israel at Sinai. Right? So here's Abraham, this fundamental foundational covenant. Then centuries later, we have this subsidiary covenant. We have this interim covenant, the Mosaic covenant, that's entered into by God and the people of Israel uh, at Sinai. And that's given until the promise to Abraham began to be fulfilled in Christ. It is a temporary, interim, subsidiary covenant to the Abrahamic covenant. And it's given for a set purpose and a set time. It's given until the promise to Abraham begins to be fulfilled in Christ. And it specified the way in which the faith of God's people was to be expressed until Christ came. You see, in the temporary nature of that covenant, you can see it in a number of places. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through chapter, verse 15 through chapter 4, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 18. You can look in Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 7, 11, 12. Many other places. So we have this covenant that God makes centuries after the Abrahamic covenant. It is the Mosaic covenant. And it is an interim subsidiary covenant that is going to be in effect and last until the promise to Abraham begins to be fulfilled in Christ. And the Mosaic covenant, that covenant that he entered into, it included... The grandest and most complete expressions to that time of God's moral requirements, God's eternal moral desires. It included the grandest expression of that, but moral requirements didn't begin at Sinai. I mean, they, they didn't, it wasn't like there were no moral requirements that people lived under until the giving of the Mosaic Law at Sinai. There were moral requirements from creation, and the flood testifies to that. I mean, what, I mean, what's the flood about? God destroys the world. Why? Because it's evil. It's wicked. It's prone to violence. Well, all of that says what? That there's a standard and there's a moral accountability that existed before Sinai. So there were moral obligations that existed prior to that time. Now, some of the commands in the Mosaic Covenant... You remember, we've got the Abrahamic covenant, we've got the Mosaic covenant, this pact, you see, with the people that he makes with Israel at Sinai. And it includes the grandest expression of God's moral desires, but moral desires didn't begin there. There were moral desires, there were moral requirements, moral obligations before. But then you have things codified in this pact. Moral requirements are codified in this pact, but some of the commands in the Mosaic covenant... They were peculiarly covenantal, meaning they were not universal moral desires of God. They erected civil, ceremonial, ritualistic. They erected amoral distinctions between Jews and Gentiles 
probably at least in part to keep the Jews separated from the Gentiles. So they would be a peculiar people, a strange people that were separate and distinct and had all of these things like circumcision, food laws, all of these rituals they went through, observance of all these holy days. So they would be distinct so it would keep them from being contaminated so that it would help them in fulfilling their purpose of being an example of people living under God, a witness to the world. So the Mosaic Covenant includes what? It includes eternal moral principles that existed, but it also includes things that are peculiarly covenantal, these things that are not eternal moral desires, but function to wind up keeping the Jews separate from their Gentile neighbors, like the food laws and those kinds of things. Now, a new covenant begun by God with the crucifixion of Christ. Okay, so we have the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Mosaic covenant, which is this temporary thing that has in the laws, the commands. It has moral requirements, but it also has these things that are peculiarly covenantal, like the food laws. But then we have a new covenant that's instituted between God and mankind in the sacrifice of Christ, and the effect of which was what? To render the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, obsolete and no longer operative. You can see that. I already cited to you 2 Corinthians, Galatians. You can all look in Galatians 4, 21, 31, Hebrews 7, 11 to 22, Hebrews 8, 6 to 13, many other places. Okay, this idea that the coming of Christ had an effect so that the planned obsolescence of this interim subsidiary covenant that covenant then became obsolete in keeping with God's plan and with that fulfillment that planned obsolescence the mosaic covenant with that what happens the set of commands the package of commands the unit the body of commands that were part of the mosaic pact the mosaic covenant all of those commands that were embedded in that pact, they then ceased to have effect. They ceased to be binding. This is an important thing to understand. The Mosaic law as a set of commands is no longer binding. We're no longer under that. But that doesn't mean that there are not ongoing moral requirements you know, that have continuing validity and even find their full expression in the new covenant, the Mosaic law, that it ceased to be binding. You see that it's clear from texts like Romans 10, 1 to 4, Galatians 3, Hebrews 7 again. But it's also clear for that specific regulations that were part of the Mosaic law. So we have statements that the Mosaic law ceased to be binding. But it's also clear that it ceased to be binding because we have, we have regulations that were part of the Mosaic law that are clearly said to be no longer binding. Things like Sabbath regulations. Things like food laws. Things like circumcision. And I could give you text on that when I post the notes. You can have all the citations. But you see, so you see that, that, that those things there, we see it so clearly. Those things that are part of the Mosaic Covenant. He says, look, they're no longer binding. That's why Paul, who's a Jew, he could declare in 1 Corinthians 9, 21. He's not under the Mosaic Law. What does he mean? He means what I'm telling you. Is that the Mosaic law, in terms of that body and set of commands that were part of that Mosaic pact, when that pact, the planned obsolescence of that pact was completed with the coming of Christ, then he, that, those, that set of commands ceased to be binding. So Paul can say, I'm not under the Mosaic law. You think then Paul would say, I'm free to sin in ways the Mosaic law condemned? No. He wouldn't say that, and I'll show you something about that in a second. Okay, so the, it's the set of commands, you see, that, that, that are there, but you have these individual things. I've tried to use the example like when you move from one state to another. Like if you move from Florida, there's a body and a set of laws called the Florida law, you know, Florida statutes, Florida case law, all that stuff. Florida law. When you move to Arizona, there's a different body and set, you see? Now, there may be overlap. But I'm not in Arizona. I'm not under Florida law. Does that mean that I have no responsibilities and no requirements that, that replicate some of the requirements of Florida law? No. You see, I do indeed have some of those. And you can see this, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul commands children, what? To honor your father and mother. He quotes from the Ten Commandments. 
This is why, what, what do we talk about? We say, well, they, he's quoting from the Ten Commandments. Well, how is that, Paul? No, no, none of that has anything, any validity. And what do you mean? He's saying it to them. So obviously that command carried on, didn't it? And so he says that, for example, there he quotes out of the Ten Commandments. And the t- Ten Commandments are reflected in the New Testament commands and in the New Testament prohibitions against murder, adultery, stealing, lying, coveting. Do we think because in the Old Testament we have these things that they are proscribed, that now in the New Covenant they're no longer the desire of God and we're free to act that way? No. No, you see, that's not what it means when it says we're not under the Mosaic Law. Uh, it, it's the set and the body uh, of commands, okay? There are literally hundreds of commands in the New Testament. Do's and don'ts. I know we hate that. But it's just data. <laughs> it's a fact. You know, if someone has said facts are sub- stubborn things, it is a fact. That there are literally hundreds of commands in the New Testament issued by spirit-inspired writers. Now that some commands included within the Mosaic Law have ongoing validity while others don't. I think you can see it clearly from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19 where Paul says, Circumcision is nothing, but obeying the commandments of God is everything. <laughs> you going... You're going, what? Circumcision is a commandment of God. Well, Paul would say, I don't mean those kinds of commandments. You see? Circumcision is nothing, but obeying the commandments of God is everything. Well, what do you mean? The commandments of God, I'm not talking about those kinds of things, those things that were peculiarly covenantal. I'm talking about the eternal moral desires of God that existed and people were under them before, that were embedded in the Mosaic Covenant. That covenant is obsolete, so the set of commands no longer have applicability. But don't think for a moment that the moral desires of God that were embedded in that thing don't continue. They do continue. And you and I honor God. And that's what Paul is saying when he says, listen, do you think that we nullify the law? No, we uphold the law. Would you say, Paul, you uphold circumcision? No, I'd say what I say in 1 Corinthians 7, 19. I'm not talking about that aspect of the law. There's a distinction. There's a distinction, you see. And so this comes out, and I just think it is absolutely critical that we grasp this. Or or when you read the New Testament, you just be going, does it make sense? And it does. It does. Now, the fundamental ethical requirement for the Christian, as I've said many times, the center, the essence, the bullseye of Christian ethics is love. That is the heart, the center of Christian ethics. You can see that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. So the heart of Christian ethics is love, but some specific conduct is loving and other conduct is not. When you say that the bullseye of Christian ethics is love, that doesn't mean that all I have to do is sit here and say, I feel. No, 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 there's there's content to this. It's not just this vague kind of thing that has no meaning to it. There's content to it. So if you're sleeping with your neighbor's wife, you don't love your neighbor. Oh, no, no, but I really have warm feelings. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. There is clear content. Some specific conduct is loving, others is not. Love is the center, but there are definite requirements on how love expresses itself. Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Romans 13, verse 9. Paul says that the command to love your neighbor as yourself, that command, love your neighbor as yourself, it encompasses other commands. It encompasses the commands of the law not to commit adultery, not to murder, not to steal, not to covet, and other commands that Paul doesn't specify. So do you see how he says, look, this is the command, love your neighbor as yourself. 
But that command isn't some vague, amorphous, meaningless kind of thing. It has teeth. It has content. There is meaning to what love somebody is. And so you love that. That then encompasses these commands of the law. They are a part of that heart and center. Don't commit adultery. Okay. The things that Paul lists there. So the Christian, though not being under the Mosaic law, not under the set the package, the body, the unit of commands that were part of the Mosaic Covenant, the Christian, what, upholds the transcendent moral requirements that are included in that law. All right, that's a long little side thing, okay? But I don't see how I can explain to you what Paul is saying when he says, rather we uphold the law, when we have the idea, oh, no, no, law, just anything Mosaic, just throw it in the trash. It has no meaning, no validity, nothing. And you sit and go, well, what are all these commands? What is that? And you, know, and you just go crazy. So I'm trying to give you a way of, of understanding this. I think it's the right way. Okay, but at least it's coherent. And I think that's very important in studying the Bible. You see? So, all right. So now, uh, next we get to in, in chapter 4. All right, chapter 4, verse, verses 1 to 8. He says, what then shall we say, Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has discovered. For if Abraham was pronounced righteous from works, he has a reason to boast, but it's not so before God. For what does the Scripture say? And Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, the wages are not credited according to grace, but according to debt. But to the one who does not work, but believes in the one who pronounces the ungodly righteous, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as also David declares the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose acts of lawlessness were forgiven and whose sins were covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord in no way credits. So here we have Paul. He's made the claim that salvation is by grace through faith for both Jew and Gentile, and that boasting before God is therefore excluded. So having made those claims, those statements, those declarations, he addresses whether Abraham contradicts that claim. You see, this is important because he he no doubt chose Abraham because Abraham was revered by the Jews. He was revered by the Jews as their father and he was held up particularly as a model of obedience to God. He was a paragon of obedience to God. Douglas Moo in his commentary, he says, uh, notes that in Judaism, Abraham's, quote, righteousness and mediation of the promise were linked to his obedience. It even being argued that he had obeyed the law perfectly before it had been given, end quote. Now that give you an, that'll give you an idea of how Abraham was viewed, okay, in the Jewish world. So Paul here is discussing Abraham. Does Abraham contradict this claim? He chooses Abraham because he is a paragon of obedience and piety. And also, Abraham played a a decisive role in the formation of the people of Israel and in the transmission of the promise to the people of Israel. So he has to be integrated theologically into Paul's teaching if that teaching is to have any claim of continuity with the Old Testament. You see, here we have a monster figure, monster in just a good way, large, huge. We've got this huge, towering figure of the Old Testament, and he must be integrated into what Paul is saying if Paul is to say that we are all of one piece. So he has to deal with Abraham, and he has to integrate it. He says the fact of the matter is that Abraham doesn't have a reason to boast before God. 
That's the fact of the matter. He does not have a reason to boast before God. As Scripture says, Abraham believed God and it was credited, reckoned to him as righteousness. And that means by faith, Abraham had credited to him a righteousness that did not inherently belong to him. He had it credited to him. It wasn't inherently his. The righteousness was given to him. His response to God's promise resulted in God reckoning or imputing to him a status of righteousness. And so Paul's saying, look, Abraham's, he's right with me. Abraham is perfectly consistent with what I'm telling you here. He's perfectly consistent with this. If the righteousness or salvation... If that is, in fact, by works, well, then God is what? He's obligated to give it. If that's the case, if that's the truth, then he's obligated to give it, just as an employer is obligated to give an employee the wages that he's earned. Is that how it is with God? I go ahead and I do enough stuff, and I come in and I go, pay up, dude! Is that how it is? That's not how it is. You see, that's not how it is with God at all. See, that would contradict this non-negotiable theological axiom of Paul that God acts toward his creatures graciously. He acts toward his creatures without compulsion, without necessity. No one extracts something from him. God gives graciously. God is indebted to no one. On the other hand... This axiom that God acts graciously, that axiom is honored in the person whose righteousness is a gift given by God on the basis of faith. That's honored. He says he doesn't earn this like an employee earning wages. It's a gift given by God, and so it's given in God's grace. It is a completely unmerited gift that God gives. So obviously Paul's point is the righteousness of Abraham was not earned. So he's not inconsistent with the gospel I'm preaching. It wasn't earned, by the way, not even by his faith. See, faith is not a meritorious work. Faith is simply saying, I'll take it. I'll receive it. You see, it's not, it's not an achievement. Okay? Now, if Abraham's works, if his works didn't earn him righteousness, nobody's works will. That's another benefit of using Abraham. Because he's this paragon of obedience. John Chrysostom, who was a bishop of Constantinople, 398 to 407, he wrote, For a person who had no works, to be justified by faith was nothing unlikely. But for a person richly adorned with good deeds, not to be made just from these, but from faith, this is the thing to cause wonder and to set the power of faith in a strong light. Abraham was quite the guy. You see, quite the guy. But his righteousness was nevertheless a gift that was given to him, that was credited to him. It was not earned by him. He did not put God in his debt through his performance so that he could come kick in heaven's door and say, it's a payday. What do you got for me? That's not the case. So he's integrating Abraham here. Now, when you talk about this, you have to deal somewhat with James. At least you don't have to, but I do. (laughs) You have to at least, you know, in a footnote, go over and talk about James. Because James says in chapter 2, verse 21, Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Now, what I think is going on there is that James means justified in the sense that he maintained the righteous status that had been previously bestowed on him. And one maintains one's righteous status by works only. Only in the secondary or derivative sense that biblical faith necessarily and inevitably expresses itself in works. See, without works, one ceases to be right with God, not because works earn or achieve anything, but because works are the pulse of faith. 
You see, they are an expression, a manifestation. Genuine biblical faith inevitably manifests itself in life. If there is no manifestation, there is no living, saving, biblical faith. So it's a derivative sense. You see that he's talking about there, I'm convinced. James stresses the works component. Why does James, you see in a couple of places, James stresses the works component, the, the manifestation that accompanies biblical trust. Why does he do that? And he does that because he's addressing the error that one can be saved through a non-working faith, a dead faith, through a mere intellectual assent, through simply thinking, I think that's true, but I don't surrender my will to it. That's not biblical faith. And Paul would agree wholeheartedly, if that's what you mean by faith, no. But they both would agree, if by faith you mean the full-orbed biblical faith of not simply the mind but the surrender of the will according to that, well then yes, that is what saves, that is how one receives the gift. So I think that, and then on James, in, in James 2.24 he says a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Again, he means not by intellectual assent alone. And it's easy to get confused. See, he means not by intellectual assent, faith in the sense of mere believing, dead faith. You see, a person is not justified by that kind of faith. All right, Paul refers to God in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, as the one who justifies the ungodly. Now, that's a bold statement. The one who justifies the ungodly, bold indeed in light of Old Testament passages that condemn human judges who justify the guilty. Isaiah Isaiah 5, 23, Proverbs 17, 15. And in light of Exodus chapter 23, verse 7, where God declares that he will not justify the wicked. That's a bold statement for Paul to make. You see, a bold statement. The difference, I think is that justify in Romans chapter 4 verse 5 refers not merely to a judicial decision in which the guilty go free. You see, not merely to that kind of thing, where the, a judicial decision where the guilty go free, something that mocks justice, condones evil, trivializes the wrong. That's what God's talking about when a judge sits here and somebody's wrong and guilty and you say, I don't care. He's not talking about that, rather he's talking about a redemption of the guilty. He's talking about their liberation through the payment of the tremendous price of Christ's atoning death. You see, so when he sits here and he says that he justifies the ungodly, and over here he says, you can't justify the ungodly, we're talking different things. He means justify through redemption that doesn't trivialize sin and gives him the way to forgive that honors both his love and his justice. He's talking over here about somebody who mocks justice. Okay? So I think think that's, but that's a bold statement. And so as you look at that, I'm I'm sure some of you are going, hmm, I seem to recall some other things about that. Okay? So that's, that's my thinking on that. Now David, you see David also confirms the truth of righteousness apart from works. Right? David's living right under the law, right? He confirms this truth of righteousness apart from works when in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, he declares blessed. He declares blessed those whose sins were forgiven. See, whose sin was not reckoned against them. Righteousness is credited. It's credited not by counting one's works. Righteousness is credited not by counting one's works, but by not counting one's sins. Righteousness is credited that way. It's not something you've done, but it's the forgiveness of something you've done. You see, that's what, so he says, what did David, what did David have to say about this? Well, David's right with me. How about Abraham? Doesn't Abraham show that you're crazy? Not at all. How about David? David will show, no. I'm right in line. You see, I'm flowing out of the history of God's working with the people of Israel. All right, 9 to 12. I know that bell's going to ring. I heard that first one. It says, is this blessing then upon the circumcised only? 
or also upon the, uh, upon the uncircumcised. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? It was not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith which existed in uncircumcision so that he might be the father of all who believe while in uncircumcision so that righteousness may also be credited to them and the father of the circumcision to the ones not of circumcision only but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham that our, that our father Abraham had in circumcision the footsteps of the faith our father Abraham had in uncircumcision. Okay? So, I mean, this is... Sometimes when you just read the things, you sit here and go, oh, what is it? <laughs> you see? It's, it, it's, it, but it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, Paul is saying... Paul sits here and he says, look, in the, in the first part, Abraham shows that the blessing of imputed righteousness, the forgiveness of sins, is for the uncircumcised, the Gentile, as well as for the circumcised, for the Jew. After all, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness before he was circumcised. So he says, don't you see what he, what he reflects? Don't you see what he reflects? It was credited to him as righteousness before he was circumcised. Circumcision for Abraham, it was simply an after-the-fact confirmation of what was already present by faith. It didn't affect the transaction. He was already righteous by faith when he was circumcised. So this has implications, right? He received circumcision as a sign of his pre-existing righteousness of faith. He says this happened so that he might serve as the father of all who believe. He might serve as the father of all who believe, both Jew and Gentile, because he believed while he was uncircumcised, like Gentiles uncircumcised, because he believed, you know, he believed while uncircumcised, he's the father of Gentile believers. They could claim Abraham. He was righteous by faith in uncircumcision. Abraham's my father because I share his faith. I heard that bell. Let me finish this. Okay? He's my father by faith because he was righteous by faith in uncircumcision. So I, as a believing Gentile, a Christian Gentile, one who puts my trust in God and his promises and what he's revealed about Jesus, Abraham's my father. But he also says, he says, look, he believed while uncircumcised, he's the father of Gentiles, because he believed and was also circumcised, he's qualified to be the father of all Jewish believers. So he's got both covered. He's Gentile believers and Jewish believers meaning those who follow Abraham's faith by believing God's promise in Christ. It is through faith and not through incorporation into the nation of Israel that one becomes Abraham's spiritual child. You can be his spiritual child as a Jew in circumcision by the faith of Abraham, or you can be his spiritual child as a Gentile in uncircumcision by the faith of Abraham. He stands here as the father of both. Faithful, righteous, in uncircumcision. But he goes on. He gets circumcised. So he's the father of Jews and Gentiles who believe, who walk in his footsteps of faith. Okay, you got an extra minute for free. All right. Thanks for coming. <laughs>